uh, then kidney dysfunction, neuropsychological dysfunction, and reproductive disorders. I've got the research that's occurred within the last year, and here's I can find with the through Mike Ziff and through the computer searches in Medline Libraries. So that's the purpose behind this. It's not just to sit on your library uh, on your shelf. You know, how many of us buy books and never crack them? I mean, we're so enthused to the meeting, and, and we end up buying this book and reading the introduction, and, and hey, that's exciting, put it on the shelf. This is, I see this as a tool, you know, so that's what it is, and there was some at the table, and if you have any questions, I'll see you during the break. What's the name of it? It's uh, does does mercury from dental amalgams influence systemic health? So good job, Barry. Thanks. Bravo. Uh, change in the schedule will be um, Dietrich will talk from eight thirty to nine, and then Dr. Jaffe will talk from nine to eleven. Then we'll take a break from eleven to eleven thirty, and then we'll have our remaining two speakers. Okay, Dietrich, would you please like to come up here and give us more? Excellent uh, wisdom. Uh, uh, good morning. I, I first uh, really like to answer some questions that people have been asking me uh, this morning, yesterday night, uh, just regarding some of our own teaching. Like we demonstrated yesterday some of the muscle testing, how we use it to get down to the root cause of what's not right in the system and then sort of get into the body that way and then start working with the things that present and uh, so th those people who want to learn that you know there is several levels of courses that we offer that are all hands-on you know, there's two neurotherapy courses one A and one B the A course uh, we teach the scar injections and the, the sort of more superficial injections segmental therapy tonsil injections eye injections uh, working with the kidneys and so on and so forth and in the, in the B course uh, which one is coming up in November? Uh, we go over the deeper the ganglion blocks, the stellate ganglion, sphenopalatine, uh, gesserian ganglion, uh, submandibular ganglion, all the ones that are in the facial area, and also show how to use the laser and uh, the electro block in an electric modality, how to do these blocks without needles. So that's a, the, the B course. Then we have which may be interesting for some of you, we have a healing retreat uh, twice a year. The next one is coming up over Thanksgiving. For those of you who feel like you know something isn't right and you you just want to get really down to to your own healing and and give that a big boost and kickstart and and get off on the right track, because our experience with with healing is that most people have these blockages, you know, that we call interference fields, and if as long as you have those actively in you. Um, none of the other modalities will work very well for you. you. You won't respond to acupuncture, chiropractic. All these things will work a little bit, but none of them will have the punch that you want. And so we, we spend five days together getting with it and, of course, getting at the, first of all, at the emotional factors. So we spend like three days mostly getting down to childhood experiences, clearing those out as they relate to, to your current illnesses or fatigue. So. Um, using a, a breathing technique. It's not an easy workshop. It's hard. It's going to be hard work required on you, but it's very loving and very beautiful and very nourishing. And then the last two days we spend, you know, doing neural therapy, doing injections, uh, treating you, and uh, in, in catching you up and getting stuff out of the way, getting the major blockages removed. So, those of you who are interested <coughs> in that, who kind of really want to dedicate some time to to your healing, that's available. And then in uh, March, uh, we have a, a in Seattle. Th these are in Santa Fe or Albuquerque. And then in March, we have a workshop in Seattle. That's March 12th that weekend, um, where we teach muscle testing for dentists. As I showed you here yesterday, and we want to just kind of go over it one more time now, because there were a lot of questions for, for those who who couldn't follow it and those who weren't here yesterday night, just to see it one more time and and how we select what we inject to heal the teeth. And like I said yesterday, uh, Louisa uh, from, from Seattle uh, has been the, uh, our mentor and this has developed a way of working with the teeth um, where very often it's possible to heal teeth uh, without extracting them. Yeah? To just diagnose ill teeth and then do conservative means, injections of various 
uh, remedies that I'm just going to touch on a little bit and then use the laser also and do injections and various other means to heal the teeth. And so I'm just going to touch on this this morning just in a little demonstration. And those of you who want to learn more about that and kind of get really good at it in, in a sort of uh, teaching environment where you actually do it and we check you and, and we really, you really go home with, with knowing what you do in a responsible way, that would be in March at workshop. So let's just to field some of these questions. Now, uh, <coughs> Dwayne, Dwayne, are you here? I, I, I want you to come up one more time. I just want to uh, check him. We checked him yesterday and I want to go over it uh, one more time just kind of to show you the sequence in a very easy and repeatable way and, uh, and see where we're at. Okay, um, Louisa, would you be my assistant <coughs> now for, uh, before we get into it? So I would need the, the boxes, you know, the nylon boxes. So step number one, the patient gets rid of all the metal watch and any energy increasing items that they may have on their body, like any metaphysical gadgets that they wear on their socks or shoes or under the belt or so that, that are meant to perk up their energy. Because most of these work a little bit and when something perks up your energy, it's very difficult to find the weaknesses in your energy field. Yeah? So Does the credit card... Uh, yeah, yeah, the magnetic strips are terrible. None of you should wear credit cards on your body. Because also those people who understand radionics, it links you radionically to the credit card company and uh, everything is connected to that, which is the world government. And you know, so we have a constantly sort of radionic input, you know, from that. The same if you wear banknotes on, you know, re Federal Reserve notes on you. Um, they work, you know. And I've, I've talked a little bit more open here this morning because uh, I know that the FDA agents, if they were here, they don't work Sundays, in my experience. <laughs> <laughs> and they work nine to five. They go home at five o'clock sharp, no matter what the situation is, and I don't come on Sunday, so I can cards. be a little bit more open today. You want all the cards? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, with the muscle testing, you can test for those things. You know, put a bank note on somewhere, and the whole energy goes down. So don't wear them on your body, you know, just as a, as a little trick. You get away with it for a few hours, but if you do it all the time, it affects you. It, it pulls you down, and pulls you down. Yeah, wear some pearls in your pocket, and some diamonds, and uh, you know, some love notes from somebody. <coughs> Okay, so the, f the first, test, first test is to see, to check if his autonomic nervous system is regulating in a healthy way. And what I do, I de get a healthy muscle, strong muscle, be strong. Then I put the middle of my palm over his belly button. I told my wife about this. <laughs> um, by the way, if you do this a lot, you get to where you look at the belly button and you know the soul of the being you're working with. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Am I, is there any hope? <laughs> and he doesn't go weak, which means he's blocked. Now, knowing he's a dentist, the most likely cause for blockages is heavy metal toxicity. What we do then, and then we have two options. We need to get through the blockage in order to be able to test him at all. And the, the first thing, uh, that I do in the office, when I'm sure, I put uh, the antidote for silver amalgam on his body. And I start with one of these boxes. Two boxes. Interesting, so it's two boxes. And he goes strong again at three boxes. That means there's a window of normal regulation at two boxes. Yesterday it was three, but then he got a treatment. And when anyone gets a treatment, it means that immediately, and we can measure that in the urine, they start throwing out the toxins. Yeah? The, the, if the iron pumps work, and we talked about that yesterday, the person has the means to detox themselves, but they're blocked. And by us doing the right intervention with the local anesthetic, like I showed yesterday, the person will start to detox. So he threw out some toxins overnight. He was a three boxer yesterday. I said that equals about the excretion of nine micrograms of mercury over a 24 hour <coughs> period. So he's now down to about four micrograms uh, per 24 hours. That means we cleaned up the ground system by the intervention yesterday to some degree. So he's two boxer now. So he is, he is now going weak on two boxes. Then 
Now I've got a normal patient. Now I can go through the potential interference <coughs> fields in him and check him. This brain, you know, he goes weak on the brain, the sinuses, uh, tonsils, thyroid, the lung. Yeah, and I squeeze his heart. Try, try to be strong. Yeah, and yesterday he went weak on the heart. He's really like sort of now, his mind is getting in a little bit. He's anticipating he should go weak on the heart, but he really isn't. Uh, do, do you feel it? Yeah, let's just kind of go over it again. So his brain is going weak. Tonsils, and I can now differentiate. Left tonsil is okay. Right tonsil is weak. Vice Sorry, versa. Vice versa. I look at the right one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm switched probably. <laughs> so left tonsil <laughs> is weak. And then we go to the heart and squeeze it a little bit to create a little bit ischemia. And he's really okay on the heart. And then we can go through liver, prostate, and so on and so forth. So uh, we know yesterday he had a, a, a heart weakness, which concerned me a lot. And then let's just simulate like what we did yesterday. Uh, he was weak on the heart. And then we do a technique called two-pointing because we know there's a, then you know your relationships, we call them causal chains. We know that very frequently the tonsils, we, we know from more normal medicine, rheumatic fever, yeah, it's a ton, con, tonsil condition, strep, post-strep infection, antibody type of thing that affects the heart valves. Yeah. So we know there's a con condition where the tonsils affect the heart. It's a very well-known one in medicine. So what we do then to confirm that whether it's a case, we do a technique called two-pointing. Yeah, he goes weak when I hold this. He goes weak when I hold the heart. So now I'm holding the heart. <coughs> yeah, he goes weak. Now hold your tonsil on the side. Yeah, and he went strong yesterday. That tells me it's a cause-effect relationship. That means I need to look at the tonsils. The tonsils are causing something in the heart. So what we did yesterday and what we can do now, honestly, I look at the tonsil. Yeah. He's weak. And now the most common reason why the tonsils are an interference field in his age is that there's an infection in the jawbone <coughs> that drains through the tonsillar area and continuously affects the tonsils. We injected yesterday the lower left wisdom tooth area. Yeah. And what that did for us, it cleared all these tests. But now, 12 hours later, the tonsils are testing again, meaning that we didn't heal the underlying problem. However, the heart is still testing well. That means we resolved, we interrupted that main connection between the wisdom tooth and the heart. The heart is now still in a, in a joyful space. Yeah? This correlates, by the way, with thermographic studies and arteriographic studies. Uh, if somebody tests weak, there's decreased blood supply to the area. If you test strong, there's good blood supply to the area. So we open up the blood supply to the, to the heart. The coronary arteries are now out of spasm or out, you know, they're dilated. They're flooding the heart with, with good nutrients and everything. So now we do the technique called uh, hold your wisdom tooth, the, the same <coughs> one. And so he still goes weak on the wisdom tooth. That means our Novocaine injection didn't heal the tooth. Yeah, you, you're on me? Yesterday we treated him, he was strong for a while, but now he's weak again, the tonsil is active again. That means whatever process is going on in there is still going on, we didn't heal it. And we didn't expect it to heal. Because an infection, you cannot heal with a Novocaine injection. You can heal the electrical component of it. That means the effect the infection has on the nervous system, you can interrupt for a while or for good sometimes. But the infection you cannot heal with a Novocaine injection, there we need different types of remedies. And we get to that in a moment. So now I ask him to hold the tooth again. Yeah? He goes weak. Now I'm holding the tonsil. This is a technique we call two-pointing. Yeah? And now you see he goes strong. Two things that went weak before, <coughs> if I hold them together simultaneously, he goes strong. That means in our technique there's a cause-effect relationship between the two. It's either the tonsils causing a bad tooth or a bad tooth causing the tonsils. And th there's then techniques where we can find out which one is causing what, but in this case it's obvious that you know, the tonsils don't cause a bad, bad tooth, but bad teeth drain through the tonsils, and they're causing the tonsils to be bad. So um, we, we know we have, that co uh, we have that connection, and now we want to look, is there any other means that we can use to treat this tooth that would be more effective than what we did yesterday? 
Yeah? And this is where the laser comes in. The laser, in my opinion, what it does, <coughs> uh, we know from, from Rife's machine and from, from various other sorts of research that bacteria is sensitive to various types of electromagnetic <coughs> frequencies. Yeah? And the bacteria that live in jawbone, they like dark, they like low oxygen, and they like bad diet, and so on and so forth. Yeah, they depend on certain conditions. And when we put the laser there, the infrared laser, uh, that's one means of bringing light there. And what simply happens is that the bacteria, like we can demonstrate in many cases, like we hold the laser, there's a huge bone infection with a few laser treatments, take another x-ray six weeks later, and the jawbone looks completely normal. Yeah? Now, it doesn't mean, like Chris has demonstrated to me in all cases, that the jawbone has completely healed but it's definitely radiologically normalized, and in many <coughs> cases there is true healing. Yeah? So what happened to the bacteria? Well, you know, if you go from an infected jawbone, osteomyelitis in a jawbone, to normal jawbone, obviously the bacteria must have left, walked out, and made space you know, for your body to heal. So I don't believe uh, that the bacteria gets killed from the laser. It's simply not strong enough, but I believe it creates a and, and a vibration, or however you want to call it, in the area that's unpleasant. Like, you know, if you go out and the sun is too bright, yeah, or it's too hot, you go and, you know, to a shady place, and this, it's bacteria is the same, they're intelligent beings. You create a, a situation that will say, oh my God, you know, it's really bright here, and they just kind of go somewhere where there is more shade, you know, and usually by the time they leave the area and go to where more shade is, what they don't know is they're walking now in the territory of the enemy. Now they get <coughs> in the territory where the immune, sy the immune system is active, and boom, they get clubbed, you know, by your antibodies, and before they know it, they're out of the jawbone. And uh, we, we know that that's happening because very often when you do the laser, the next day the patient comes in, they have a low-grade fever, uh, they feel miserable, they feel totally destroyed, and I give them IV vitamin C, a high whack, 50 grams, and the whole episode is over and the jawbone heals very wonderfully. Yeah? <coughs> so this is uh, one of the ways uh, I, I suspect the laser is working, a very simple, using a very simple paradigm here. So now we want to find out what remedy. Would you take over at this point <coughs> and I'll be your <coughs> assistant? <coughs> yeah, well, to see if you can, if you can get to him that <coughs> way, if you can be in, uh, in, 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 the, in the mode. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That's my differential diagnosis. If it's an electric uh, interference field, that means it's just a scar over the wisdom tooth or a scar on the bone. They feel great the next day. If they feel miserable the next day, you know there was true infection there that walked out on you, <coughs> and it's now in the lymphatics in the blood. And uh, okay. why is it when you change the job position? Like <coughs> the between, you'll change the reflexes as they get tested. Well. Because you, it goes back to what I lectured on the first day, the four component theory. <coughs> yeah. Now you're taking one component out of the equation, and the body goes back into adaptation. It can now compensate for this one bad thing that's still there. But that's why Louisa introduced me to the hand mode symbols that she's using in the hand. We can always get through that. Yeah. So it's just Wissendahl's technique or some of the more superficial muscle testing techniques can't get through that. It looks like the patient apparently is fixed and he's not. So you need to then get, get through a way to get to a deeper level of what's going on. You always find the, the infection of the jawbone again. <coughs> Thank you. Will it work for you? Will yeah, he was getting locked up. It's just that. Okay. You usually just get vitamin C, uh, 50 <coughs> the other just brings up the laser with you to kind of ideal. 830 nanometers. Oh, let me just kind of go, go back. Let me just kind of show the chlorella thing because it may help you. He's got chlorella in his pocket right now. Okay. Okay, I just wanted to show you like something that Louisa did here sort of as a trick. Whoop. Let's take so <coughs> remember like the the two amalgam boxes were unblocking him, yeah? But the homeopathics are kind of weak unblocking agent. It allows me to quantify what's going on. It's diagnostically very interesting, but it doesn't often hold for very long. Sometimes the patient sort of tends to collapse. And the better way uh, to unblock him, yeah, he's blocked is to stick 
uh, give him a bottle of Chlorella in the hand. That's how we, f how we simply find out what works you know, for the detox. You can give him deep penicillin, you can give him a bottle of DMPS, DMSA, and that way we can immediately find out which detox agent this body will like. And there's a difference de depending on what the composition, you know, the picture of the heavy metals is in him. And so hold, hold the, the Chlorella. You know, I give him the Chlorella bottle in the hand and he very nicely and beautifully opens up with it. And then we just simply put it in his pocket and then we got an open patient. And this is how we found the Chlorella. You know, and then we tested with the DMPS, stressed it and find that in fact the Chlorella gets all the stuff out. It correlates so beautiful. You know, and this way we can very quickly scan through a whole host of things. You know, I mean, Louisa must have looked at hundreds of thi things you know, before she came up with this one. So I'm, I'm just kind of giving, I think he may be doing better without the, the stuff in his pocket. Yeah. Have it, have it <coughs> okay, so hold tight, and let's see if you're still communicating. Yeah. Okay. So touch the wisdom juice socket. Mm -hmm. So now we're trying to find out which remedy to inject that's stronger than just local anesthetic. Okay. So, uh, <coughs> so keep keep the therapy localization there. So we'll see if this is an issue for him if he wants this, and he says he doesn't change. So he says no. Uh, I tell you in a moment. And hold tight. Yeah. And he changes strength there, so he's indicating that he wants this. So she simply holds it. She simply holds it close to his energy field. Yeah. Uh, this remedy is called arthroquilan A. Yeah. That's uh, uh, This is called arthroquilan A. That's an alive bacteria uh, called Siphonospora, and Siphonospora is a type of bacteria that in a mutated form likes to live on the roots of the teeth. But uh, this form does some magic to the bad form. Yeah, basically, what, what this does, uh, these bugs copulate with the bugs that are there and they make babies that are completely innocent. Yeah? And in the process, both this and the other one disappear. Yeah? Basically, the, the shells, the, the, the cell walls break open they release the babies, the babies are very harmless to you, and in the process, the bad bugs get eaten up. Yeah? A very simple, nice process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, write the, I write the names on the board <laughs> later for those of you, because there's two main remedies that we find over and over in the teeth that neither the Germans know about nor the Americans know about, <laughs> and they're so re reproducible that it's wonderful if you can get your hands on just those two for you, Dennis, because they come up over, and even if you don't muscle test, you draw up half an ampoule each and inject it around the tooth, and you're always going to be winning. Okay, so hold up tight, strong muscle. Now let's have you touch that wisdom tooth socket again. Hold tight. Okay, and hold tight. So he likes this, so I don't have another hand. I'm just going to put it in his pocket. <coughs> so we're working from strength right now because he's saying, yes, I, I need that. And then what I'm doing is I'm just asking if his body if he needs anything else with a with a little signal that says, well, is that all? Is that all you'd like injected into that tooth? And his body says, no, I'd like a little more because it changes strength again. If it stayed the same, it'd be saying, I'm happy with that. So would you tap that wisdom tooth socket very vigorously? Outside or inside? inside? So basically we're going to that tissue and saying, is there any piece of that tissue that's not satisfied? Tap real vigorously the whole area because I don't know exactly what part it is. And we're just waking <coughs> up that area and saying, okay, what would you like now? We'd like to address you, see what you'd like. Okay. This is the part you know, that none of you have been doing so far that work with injections in the mouth and where you missed out, you know, on. Okay, so stay there so he's in weakness. And hold tight. Okay, and he says he'd like some local anesthetic, which we'd expect. So keep that finger there, and I'm just gonna put this in his pocket, load him up with this treatment. <coughs> now he's nice and strong and he says he's finished, so what I'll do is I'll put a little pattern in again and I'll say, well, are you absolutely finished? And he, again, he says no. There's a little area that's probably the most toxic that still needs some help. So really get around that whole mm -hmm. area because I don't know exactly where it is. And Chris tap. said last night I've got a little amalgam tattoo. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it could be the most toxic area that says these two are great, but not quite enough. <coughs> <coughs> Did 
Rick, I, I just explained the, the, the recommendations for Arthur A being intramuscular, you know, it's like some of those echinacea compounds are injections. Well, um, and, and you're putting it right into the, the, the soft connective tissue. Yeah. I don't have any experience with putting it IM. We always put it in the tooth, and that seems to work just wonderful. Yeah. Well, the Germans just use it for arthritis. <coughs> That's their main indication. See, the Germans didn't know. Putting it in, I guess, to avoid uh, a reaction. You know, in other words, uh, something that has an have to clean up. Mm -hmm. uh, and swelling or whatever. You know, this one. Put it in the muscle. Huh. You know, this one, Ed, really doesn't give big healing crises. Arthur Keelan A is pretty pretty gentle well, and just works. Well, I haven't done it, but yeah. check it out. It's not too, you know, too one of those ones that you worry about. Okay. And relax. Yep. Yeah. And hold that wisdom tooth socket again. So he's still going weak. His body's saying, I'm not satisfied completely. So then we check another product. Hold tight. Yeah. And he goes very strong. So same thing. I'm going to put this in his pocket. He's got three remedies on him now. What was the third one? Uh, Pefrakeel, the other magic bullet for the teeth. It didn't test initially, but we went back to it, adding it as a, in the combination, in the cocktail. That's what the body is asking for. Okay, so hold tight. So his body's going strong. He's saying, my wisdom tooth socket is completely satisfied. So again, I just use this, nope, stay right there. He's completely satisfied. So then I just use this patterning again, and I say, well, is there anything else? And he stays strong. So it's just a little trick to make sure we have every piece of tissue, every area of tissue in there satisfied. What's your hand position you're using and place you're putting that? I'm just touching it specifically. Let me, uh, let me just, kind of take, uh, uh, just kind of take the word on that because we, we don't want to get into the metaphysical aspect of it. But this is a, a hand position. Basically, it has to do very much with martial arts. Yeah, if you fight with someone, they have a machine gun and you have a pocket knife and you want to win the fight, Obviously, you can't meet them on even ground. And as a hand position, you know, if we do that, it strips the energy field of your opponent for a moment. And so we try to get strip his energy completely of any adaptations, any defenses, and get down to having him naked in front of us. Yeah. And if that, that would reveal any weakness that's still there, you can't compensate for it in some way. And so that's the hand position. You may want to show what it is without getting into why and, and how. It's, yeah. it's a hand mode that's been clinically correlated with, um, with um, synergy is what I call it, which just means is there anything else. So you put your index finger over your thumb and then you touch your thenar pad with your, um, with your uh, index finger. Or your penis. <laughs> 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 I know, my hands are so, I've been doing this so long. Try, you just do your best, you know. And then you fan the other three fingers and then you all nar flex. All nar flex. <laughs> and then I was teaching I was teaching a course in Puerto Rico the other day and told them you saw what this does and they all kind of went, you know, to each other. <laughs> but it's like Dietrich saying, we're just kinda of pushing them around, you know, saying, Is that tooth completely happy? It's a way of just Challenging the system, and his body says no, 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 until he got until he has exactly what he needs. <coughs> Which are these three remedies? Well, local anesthetic and two remedies. Like a okay. Touch him anywhere when you yeah, yeah. It's just okay. Kind of like so, Chris, uh, where's Chris? Would you come up and and get the get the magic bullet ready? So the nice thing is with Louisa's work, we found that this combination is the one that tests you know, nine out of ten times for the teeth. <coughs> and satisfies almost any infected tooth, any infected area. And since we've known this combination, we've been able to heal more teeth than ever before uh, with injecting this, then holding a laser on it for a couple of minutes, which synergistically enhances the, the effect of this injection. And well, we don't know. We don't know, but I have now at least 10 cases, you know, with x-ray evidence, you know, they weren't okay before. And they now look completely normal on x-ray. The test normal, vita vitality testing showed a dead tooth before. Now it tests alive. So it changed every single test that we can do on it. And so I feel it's uh, the best thing we know so far. And I'm so you have x-rays to show that when there's a laminar dura that's broken? <coughs> and you're going to show that sometime? 
I don't know, you know, because I don't want to get in trouble, you what know. Was the uh, uh, Chris? Well, Chris taught me, you know, everything he knows about x-rays. Now, I'm not as sensitive, you know, as he is, you know. I mean, he looks at an x-ray across the room and sees stuff, you know. I'm not that good. Uh, but there is definitely the change for all the criteria that we have to establish that this tooth is an interference field. Now, this is not true for all the teeth, yeah. But if there hasn't, if there's been a root canal, I, I don't want to talk about root canals because I still think they should come out. Yeah? But if the tooth hasn't been operated on and there's been a jaw osteitis kind of simmering there in the area and it hasn't really eaten up the root and structurally the tooth is okay, um, then we've had wonderful results with it. You're using just kinesiology, you're not using the grommer? On that to find out how many vials of osteitis or pulpitis are needed? Well, uh, I use the, the same boxes, you know, so I use the jaw status uh, but boxes. Doing the on it. No. Well, no, we use, we use the same thing, like the same, we, we quantify the amalgam toxicity. I use the jaw status and the root canal nose outs. I use all of those. Yeah, but and what I'm saying is, is are you putting, do you say that one tooth will take four D3 jaw osteitis in that mandibular segment and he, he then, that's what the problem is? And you're saying you give one injection of pepper steel and one yeah. quadricolon. Yeah. Well, see, we, we, we jump. It has no yeah. more. Well, it see, has we, like a D6. Yeah. See, we, we jump without diagnosing. See, we jump from establishing this tooth as an interference field and what it affects. We jump to directly testing against the, the treatment. We can take an intermediate step and test against the diagnosis and then I do the same technique that I pile on the jaw status nose out until it balances out and can quantify the uh, the damage you know that's there but I don't do that for time reasons you know, I jump to the treatment and with this by using the the synergy mode of Louisa we kind of stripping it down to see how much you need sometimes it tests for two ampules alpha kilon A you know but there would be an exception you know usually like one ample satisfies now, do you it you have the Corel on him Dietrich yeah so yeah if if you if you don't unblock the patient before, you cannot measure him. I'm talking about after the treatment. Oh yeah, he needs to he needs to detox. See the primary, the primary blockage in him is a is a heavy metal toxicity, and unless you address that first, you can never heal a tooth because the the, the healing that we do now is, uh, depends on a functional auto autonomic nervous system, and it's only functional when he has a chlorella on board. Yeah, so the moment he would stop the chlorella, <laughs> we would waste the, you know, whatever, 20, 30 bucks. Uh, these are expensive, you know, I think the Arthokilan A ampoule costs us about $15 just for one ampoule, and the other one is a couple of bucks. So it's not a cheap treatment in terms of the... Chris, where did you inject that? Retromolar area, buccally retromolar area. Area where the wisdom tooth crown and apex used to be. Since he had an amalgam tattoo there, I put it right into the tattoo itself. Something's going on there, you can see just the tissue is red and it extends up the, uh, the ramus. By the way, but by the way, DMPS is a very nice agent to inject around amalgam tattoos to get them out. And you can quite freely inject it, you know. I've injected up to a CC, you know, in a particular area. And every time you check the patient back, there's less amalgam staining. But if it's a big blob of amalgam in the tissue, you still have to operate it out. It takes forever with the DMPS to try and get it out. But you can, with the, with the milder stains or period of time, if you have a patient, 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 yeah, you can see every time you see him, you inject DMPS around the stain, it will slowly fade away. That's, but a, good, it, that's a good point, uh, like yeah. an injector. When, you, when you're doing surgery over an area where you're taking out a tooth that has an apicolectomy, an amalgam, and you have a huge tattoo, and you muscle test and you find out you've gotten, I didn't talk about this last night, well when I'm doing bone cavitations and I think I'm done, I usually take my assistant and have her touch the patient and I'll muscle test through her as a surrogate and I'll check each area that I've worked on to make sure that it's clear. Okay, what you'll find on these large tattoos is your cavitation will be clear, but you touch the amalgam tattoo and it's not. So you still have a focus there, okay? And you got to really, that's when it takes time, you have to carefully 
clean the gingiva as best you can, scrape it with a scalpel or a curette, or kind of do it, you know, take like a, a very fine flap off that. And, and sometimes you can't do it, you'll, you'll macerate the tissue, and this would be a good place to use DMPS on that. You can just drop on, or I have used some homeopathic mercury compound that the site wasn't checking, and there was still a little mercury left in the tissue, and I dropped a drop of homeopathic medicine right into the cavitation. You can use the these patient. ampoules here that are in yeah. here, like uh, to inject them around there. Yeah, uh. and that, that zeroed the patient, and I was clear and sold it up, and that was it. But I don't close up until the patient checks positive. I mean, they're strong. You say you check various areas. Obviously, you're not going in with your finger to use a metallic instrument or something. I use a curette. Or any kind of instrument you want. I even uh, sometimes I use a subject, a, uh, a probe, gingival probe. That's not too sharp. It's relatively blunt. But I use a curette. And I just do the whole cavitational area, and my nurse is touching the patient, and I'm just going. I grab her arm and I go, Bing, 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 Bing. And if it blows in an area, I have to go back and clean that area. I miss something there. Yesterday was a question here. Can you muscle test uh, when somebody has local anesthetics on board? If you do the versatile type of superficial on the surface testing without getting through the adaptation or recognizing blockages, or so no. You put local anesthetic and they test strong, you think you're done. But if you use our technique, you get through that and still find a weakness. And, and that's why we teach in the course in March, because it's not as easy as it appears when people first uh, get into muscle testing. You know, there's a superficial layer of stuff, and you can stay on there forever and fix the superficial things and never get through to the deep stuff. And with Louisa's technique, but using the hand modes, which are symbols, which work on the subconscious and do several other <coughs> things, uh, creating spins in your electromagnetic field and so forth, that then interact with the patient's energy field. You get through those adaptations and, and you, you stir things up to the most degree and you get through. Do you, do you mind retesting here? <coughs> Right after. Well, the good stuff loves light. The bad stuff loves dark. Just like the mafia, you know. Same, same laws. Is he fixed or not? Well, do you want me to demonstrate it? Yeah. So I'm just checking again, and he is a fit candidate to test. <coughs> yeah, so sure. whenever you do an intervention, you check back if the patient is now blocked. Because what can happen, you inject something and an emotional issue pops right up. And that would express itself by the patient being blocked again, and in spite of him we have opened up everything. If he gets blocked in the middle of a treatment, it means another issue pops right up. Uh, usually it would be an emotional issue that then we would deal with in that way. And that's again another aspect. If you don't do that, don't clear that, the patient doesn't get well. So now we test a, a muscle and he's nice and strong. So touch that wisdom tooth socket, hold tight, and he's nice and strong now. So what were the other areas that were there for the Well, he, you could challenge, would you want to show him just kind of to challenge the tooth a little bit and see if he's really done? Okay, and now what you can do is have the patient vector all around the tooth to make sure. So just touch one spot and then touch another spot and get, you know, lingually and buckly. Yeah, and I can't find any weakness. It looks pretty good. Question? Okay, and then, then you know, then we go back, you know, and test the things like the brain, which was testing before, isn't testing, uh, testing now. The tonsils aren't testing now, and the heart wasn't already testing this morning, so it won't test now either. And now, now we gave him a treatment on a much deeper level than yesterday, but just using local anesthetic. Now, with this treatment, we have a chance of healing that wisdom to a socket without, without having to use surgery. And uh, now my advice is like for three minutes or so to hold the laser on there. Yeah, just right to add, right yeah, add the laser on it. Yeah. Because the laser does two things. The laser does what I said it does before, but it also penetrates tissues about two and a half centimeters. Uh, it creates a ball of illuminated tissue uh, two and a half centimeters across in the tissue whereas our injection just sits on the surface. Mm -hmm. And now what happens, yeah, light is, you, know, you can look at, it as you look at it as an energy form, is a sine wave. Yeah? And homeopathic, the molecules in a homeopathic that vibrates send off magnetic fields that have certain 
sine wave frequencies. And what we do by shining the laser through the homeopathic that we put in there, piggyback on the sine wave of the laser, we put now the vibration of the homeopathic that now infiltrates the tissue much deeper than the injection ever can. So this way we're spreading some effect of the injection, not the actual bacteria, but the energetic aspect of it. We're spreading it deep into the tissue. Yeah, so there's one way of putting homeopathics back, piggyback on the laser beam by just putting it in the tissue and then shining the laser through it. This is just for those who believe in homeopathy and who kind of want to follow that. And I put the names of those remedies uh, on the board so you can copy those. We cannot tell you where you can get the Sanum remedies. Uh, however, Christine Jackson in Seattle is the, the woman who uh, try, who's dealing with the FDA right now trying to uh, make those remedies uh, legal here and it seems like there's a good chance that uh, within two months or three months uh, they may have sort of some some status that we can actually safely use them. How effective do you, do you uh, feel on oral application of a, of a standard ready for those who, can't, who aren't able to do injections? <coughs> what, well, that's still I, effective? Yeah, when I first started out about three years ago, I had a lower right wisdom tooth socket issue and um, we just did pepper drops, you know, and I had like this right arm paresthesia and, and a tendonitis that got pretty bad at times. And I, during that same day, it was like 70% better in my symptoms, you know. But it never did get to 100% without the injection. So for years I struggled with the, the topical, which was quite good, but I was missing the neuroelectric, you know. So the, the chemistry, the sonic chemistry is really excellent but you got to change that frequency. Do you use a laser too, though? Back then? Yeah. No. Maybe, no. maybe yeah. if you used a laser yeah. with the drop, it would be effective. That'd be great. Yeah. yeah. The same, same concept. Uh, Lisa, you, you were uh, talking before about uh, you retested him and he still went weak when you had the hand over the navel. You were checking him to see if he was blocked again. Mm -hmm. You said if so, it might be an emotional issue. If that would have been the case, what, how would you determine what the emotional issue was and how would you deal with that? <coughs> well, there's tons of ways. One way is uh, we therapy localize an area in the body, the, the frontal cortex in a certain way. And just uh, if that's an issue, I put the heel of my hand right here. And if that goes weak, then we do that NET Scott Parker. Scott Walker? Scott Parker. Walker. Scott, Scott Walker Walk. technique, which is one way. Okay, uh, last, last question because we need to, to get to Russell here. Yeah. Can you just check hypothalamus? Can we just therapy localize the hypothalamus? Yeah, I mean, just uh, it gets <coughs> kinesiology to see if your therapy is completely finished to check hypothalamus. <coughs> well, it's such a, a deeply adapted organ and it has such deep issues that a lot of times it's not available to speak to us. So I wish, but it's a, it's a you know that's you're talking again like on a more superficial level of system, you know a level where you can directly therapy localize on the skin the deeper issues. We don't believe in that. You know, we believe you have to challenge the body in a thousand ways and get through the superficial layer and see what's behind it. And that when things display on the surface, um, you're dealing with an extremely healthy patient. But if somebody has been chronically ill or has some chronic stuff which is what we are after here, it will never display on the surface. You know, if you're a couple of months into treatment, you've seen the patient a number of times, then you can trust in what you're getting off the, off the surface. So that's why we do these tests and you know, the, the various ways of, of getting in there. In February, you had a lady that had a heart situation. Now, obviously for this group, you directed primarily at a dental problem, uh -huh. which we appreciate. But there can be other, the blocks in these other areas that you check. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that would be a medical problem to be addressed by a physician or, or, yeah, well, a, well, or a nervy dentist. Let me, let me just remind you, you know, sort of, that's why I always start any lecture I give with my four component theory, yeah? It's by saying what we dealt with here, we dealt with on two components the electromagnetic aspect of this affecting the nervous system and the biochemical aspect by infection releasing toxins that screw up your biochemistry, two levels, 
but he also has structural problems and he also has problems in his brain, you know, emotional, psychological, psychic type of factors that are also there. And then he may be having a hundred different electrical problems in his body, but this was the one with our testing we got to is the primary one that we need to deal with. Yeah? And most of what most everyone else in the world is doing, they're starting on the surface, you know, the stuff that th most of the stuff you see that looks like illness is an adaptation to some much deeper illness. Yeah? So if somebody has chronic sinusitis, for example, very often it's an issue of chronic grief when they were five years old and parents broke up. Yeah? Now they have chronic sinusitis and it's the vent for their grief that they couldn't express then. And if you start giving them antihistamines, uh, this is a concept of homotoxicology, you push the grief deeper in the tissue. Now they're getting their <coughs> breast cancer and the other stuff. Yeah? And so then when you look at the breast cancer and want to treat that, you're dealing with an even deeper adaptation to the grief. And what you need to get to is the grief, uh, grief when they were five years old. Yeah? And that's sort of what we're trying to teach in our course is to not get fooled by the body. What you're seeing, what the patient presents as symptoms, is simply the body's adaptations for much deeper issues. And having a little experience in this, we, we get to the wisdom tooth pretty quick, which, you know, there's certain things that does kind of are sort of some main candidates. You know, and you're asking the body with the muscle testing, is it this or is it that or is it this? You get through some of the stuff until, you, until you're home. You worked through some of the emotional clearing techniques in your seminar here. Yeah. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, we have to finish like to kind of pass Thank the word you. on here. Uh, uh, thanks, Ryan. <laughs> Thank you, guys. speaker is Dr. Gene Tunick, who is a dentist practitioner now in Pacific Grove. He graduated from the University of Pennsylvania in 1958, practiced in Southern California for a few years before he went to Western Samoa, where he was the chief dentist there. And then in Sweden, he practiced from 1965 to 76. For two years at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden, he taught x-rays. And uh, he writes a column about x-rays in the local dental society newsletter and uh, continues to work in Pacific Grove as a dentist. So let's bring Gene Tunick up here. Thank you. Can we start with the videotape right away? We have to get the lights down. Well, is that about ready? Okay. I've got a little piece of videotape for you, very educational. Educational video, that's what that is. Every good speaker has educational video. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll tell you, while you're getting it warmed up, I'll tell a little story. When I found out, when I saw the schedule, oh, here we go, never mind, I'll tell you later. Louder. <laughs> okay, cut it. <laughs> That's the education. <laughs> if you don't know you have a problem, how can you fix it? Okay, what's our problem? Our problem is lousy x-rays. It's a fact, lousy x-rays. As a whole, as a group, the profession is probably weaker in that respect than most other fields. And I've talked to a couple of colleagues who are instructors at, most recently at UOP, had a nice discussion at an x-ray teachers meeting a couple of years ago. And I said, 
y you know, it's hard to admit. How is it that we do, as a group, inferior x-rays? I mean, you take the average. It's really not good. If you doubt that assertion, by the way, ask any insurance company consultant, and they will tell you that we have a big problem because we get claims in with films that we really can't judge. We don't know what to do with those claims. We have to deny them sometimes because we can't tell what the dentist wanted to do. So if there's a problem, we have to figure out what the problem is. Well, how did we get that way? And I talked to this x-ray teacher colleague, and he said, we teach fairly good training programs in the schools, but then the dentist goes out, delegates x-ray to his assistant, and takes whatever she gives him. And so hopefully she's had good training. Maybe she learned with her previous dentist. But she gets into a situation where she takes the films and she processes them, gives them to the dentist, and he doesn't know what's wrong. He's not happy. I have fellows who call me up and they, they know there's something wrong, but they haven't the foggiest notion of what. And so I try to help them out. Sometimes we can do it with very, very simple means. So the trick is to recognize where the problems come in. Now, I have some little things I want to give out, some little presents, little teeny presents. And I would like to give one to the person. Can you hear me without the mic? Can you hear me without the mic? Yeah. OK. I'd like to give one of my presents to the first person who will tell me what the number one cause of bad x-rays is. What is the commonest fault in x-rays? Pardon? No, wrong. Sitting on machine. Wrong. <laughs> Position of the x-rays. Position of the x-rays. Number one fault. That is, there's a present for you. <laughs> I hope you're overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> Number one fault. But that's not what I'm going to talk about. Sorry. Number two fault, somebody already mentioned, processing. The reason we're not going to talk about positioning is that that is a hands-on course, and you know when you see a film that's not positioned properly. You know that. So I don't really need to talk about it. You need to work with your assistant and show her how to get the film in the mouth right in the first place. Typically, a good push will help. Okay, so if we're not going to talk about that, what are we going to talk about? Processing problems. Can we have the first slide, please, <coughs> on the carousel? I do it. Can't see a thing. Well, there's something there, but I can't see it. Oh, no, there's nothing there. OK, where am I pointing? All right. I have to learn the materials here. Well, there, how about that one? One more. There we go. OK. That's where I live. If any of you here haven't had any chance, and if you still have time, that's Pacific Grove. It's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Here's another view. I practice in two blocks from there and go down there sometimes at lunchtime with my wife, who's over here, who's my RDA. And we pretend that we don't live here and say, wouldn't it be fun to live here and work here? OK, I had the very good luck of having a friend at Kodak who sent me these series of slides. And when I got them, I looked at them, and I took about two-thirds of them out because they're kind of dull. And this is a dull talk. We're talking about quality control in x-ray. When I heard from Ed that I was following Ray Bertolotti <laughs> with quality control in x-ray, I figured, oh, boy. They're going to be tired. When I've got done, they'll be fast asleep, except they want to get going. So we've got to do something about it. And so I thought about that a little bit. Can I get that to change? OK, benefits. Now, I promised myself I would not read slides to you. I hate to do that. <laughs> but I will talk about this. This is one more benefit. 
uh, as the gentleman who introduced me explained, I lived in Sweden for 10 years. This slide is in Sweden. And I guess this is probably what Thoreau had in mind when he sought out and found his Walden Pond. Peaceful, lovely little lake near the town I lived in in Sweden. And the point is that the medical legal climate in dentistry was like this pretty much when, Ed, when did you graduate? 59. 59, I graduated 58. When Ed and I started medical legally, things were pretty calm and peaceful. In those days, people had to have a reason to sue you. Okay, that's not the case anymore. <laughs> so, if your x-rays may be perfectly centered, wonderful images, but they fade out because they weren't processed properly, and you go to look at them three years later, and they're all brown and unreadable, you've got a potential problem because you know you have to save your records. Now they tell us forever. So, it ain't Walden Pond anymore, guys. You've got to have records that are readable for long after you're even out of practice. So the processing is important. It may be dull and it's drudgery, but it's important. It's just like any of your other records. This is what Kodak says you need to do to have quality control. Anybody have a unit calibrated lately? Me neither. The, <laughs> the department here in California, the Department of Radiological Health, is supposed to come around and monitor your units for you on an annual basis. They have two people to cover the state, the last I heard. So you can't count on them. Therefore, if you want to get all these tests done, and you should, if you have two units in your practice, and they're not calibrated on a reasonably regular basis, one is going to make darker x-rays than the other, and you won't even know which is which. If you have three, you're in total limbo. So we were saying, how do you know when something is wrong? Well, get rid of some of the error. Get your dental supply house to send their x-ray technician down and do these calibrations. You, can't, you can do some of this yourself, and you can get a book from Kodak on how to do it. But it's really not practical. Get a technician to come down and do this once in a while. Codex says do it every year. Okay, another little nuisance that you can get rid of is the unsafe safe light. And this is old stuff. Most of what I have here is old stuff. You've, you've heard all this stuff before. But it needs to be reminded from time to time. And you've, I think you've all heard of this. You take an x-ray film, you put coins on it. And when you leave it exposed to the safe light for five minutes, there shouldn't be any after image like that. Except this slide, with all due respect to Kodak and the x-ray prof who produced these slides, made a glaring error. And the Kodak tells you right in their brochure, take a little x-ray and pre-expose it. Which is to say, take a picture with it of something. I had a 400-year-old pig's jaw that was dug up out of the street in front of my practice in Sweden. They have lots of old stuff. And when I got it, I thought, perfect, here's my x-ray test object. Get some kind of bone with teeth in it and save it as a test object. You can take it just a single tooth and take your film, expose it at normal values, then do the safe light test because there is a preconditioning effect that sensitizes the film. You can do it this way, it's not as good. It's wrong, it's the wrong slide from Kodak. Okay. Dull stuff. You develop the film and you rinse it and you fix it and you wash it, okay? I don't want to take time with that. That's an x-ray tank for manual developing. How many people use manual processing here? That's three of us, right? And, and I will introduce you to Angie and my wife in due course. So the rest use automatic processing. There must be something wrong with the few of us who are still with this Stone Age processing technique. And that's a picture of a manual tank being replenished. That's really thrilling. Question? Yeah. You want to go backwards, huh? Yeah, that's right. I'm 
I'm not very satisfied with the uh, automatic processing. The question I have is about the temperature regulation bats. Uh, some offices don't regulate them hardly at all. They just use room temp and add a little cold and that. And the gizmo that we discovered for regulating the temperature was worth $1,000. I'd like to know what your feeling is about having that thing set up so that you can ideally regulate the temperature of the bar. Okay, the question is about, uh, he's considering going back to manual processing from automatic, and how do you regulate the temperature? I did my first commercial photo, I'm an old time photographer. This is really my claim to frame, fame here because the presentation here is not very radiographic, it's almost all photographic. So there I consider myself something of a specialist. I did my first commercial job at age 14. I was working in my dad's photo plant at age eight and helping him on photo jobs. And my dad had one word for me, his leg legacy standardize, standardize, standardize. So if you're going into manual processing, it is a little harder to standardize because the really good manual processors are thermostatic. Well, here's Kodak's, that's what the slide is in here for. Your timing of the question is perfect. What this thing shows is time and, you can't see it, but it's the time and temperature chart. Now, ideally, you should be right on 68 to 70 degrees, and the way you do that is not $1,000. There's a company called Lidol, which is a photographic company, that makes thermostatic valves. It's a valve about this big around. I mean, the, the thermometer on top is this big around. There's a thermostatic valve that goes in your plumbing with a shutoff on it, and it's got a thermostat, which you can adjust with a big knob. And they are about $500, not 1000 you, you plumb that in, and assuming that your water is cool enough in the summertime. See, if your water temperature in the summer is 75, there's no way you can get back down to 70 unless you have refrigeration. So that in places where the climate is warm, you still, sooner or later, get stuck with this problem of excessively warm developer. And so you have to cut your time down and you use Kodak's chart or whoever gives you the processing instructions. The x-ray film has an insert as a rule. There's, Kodak has this, these charts available free. They're in the booklets we handed out. Time and temperature, standardize, standardize. But it helps to have a thermostatic valve. You really can't do it right without that. Now, there are some little tips that I threw in here in this handout. I had sufficient ego to include some of the little articles I wrote for my local dental society newsletter, which are more sort of handy little tips. Well, darkroom work is all that kind of stuff. It's nothing startlingly scientific. It's little how to do it this and little how to do it that. And one of the things, if you're into manual processing, that you find if you test is that the fixer lasts about three times as long as the developer. Kodak says, just dump them both, make fresh on a regular basis, which is really the easiest way to do it. And if you're, if you're really into environmental protection, photographic fixer is now considered a toxic waste. And you don't really have to dump it every time you change your chemicals. So how do you find out whether it's time to dump it? And the answer is take a film, open it up in daylight with the light on in the darkroom, and stick it in the fixer tank. That's a film in the fixer tank and watch it with a clock going of some sort and you'll find it in fresh fixer. It clears in about 30, 40 seconds. And in old fixer, it'll take as much as two minutes. And if the fixer takes more than two minutes to clear it, then it's time to dump it. There's a cleared, <coughs> half cleared x-ray. So you can just look at it. Now, you don't have to bother with that. Just dump them all together, but if you're trying to be environmentally correct, you only need to dump your fixer one-third as often. But if you're into processors, which most of you are, you've got to change your chemicals according to the instructions. And your processor is really great because it helps you standardize. So I have, I grew up, as I said, in old-time photography, and I used manual processing because I can look at an x-ray and tell what's wrong. But I have to admit the processor has an awful lot going for it because it helps you standardize. <coughs> and again, I'm going to hold my mouth. There's nothing new there. 
and that's a picture of a processor. For those that never saw one, I don't know why Kodak even puts it in. Processor maintenance. Notice number five, item five. Yeah, how about that? Monitor with pre-exposed film strips. What's that? There. Well, that's what we're going to talk about. Because, as I said, if you know there's something wrong and you don't know how to find out what it is, what, what, what can you do? Clean, clean, clean. That uh, comes right after standardize. On the road to chemical heaven is standardize and then stay clean. Wipe it up. There's your processor instructions. Anything you want, you can get from Kodak. And to find out what you want, Kodak publishes a list of everything they have. And somewhere, here it is. I don't know if you can see it. Kodak Dental Products. Not only their film and their chemicals, but their publications, videotapes, slide series. It is a gold mine. And in the handout is Kodak's phone number. So if you don't get anything else out of this lecture, you got Kodak's phone number in the handout, and that's the road to heaven. And of course, that you should use Kodak's chemicals, unless you use microcopy or 26 others. They're all good. There's no problem with chemicals, whatever you get cheapest. That's a, an automatic processor for those who never saw one being cleaned. And this is a cute thing. It, I assume most of you know about this. This is a sheet of clear polyfilm, which is used for cleaning processors. And it's the dirt in processors that make them mess up. When the rollers get dirty, that's when you start losing your films. OK, now, handy tips. What good is it? If, uh, this is really mostly for people with manual processing. If you have a little timer that goes ding-a-ling when the film is done and the telephone goes ding-a-ling at the same time, you don't hear it, and the first thing you know, somebody forgot the films in the developer, or forgot the films in the fixer. Uh, you, when you get a, if you're going to have a timer, get one that never stops ringing. This will not stop until you turn it off. It'll ring all night, and we, a couple of times it did. <laughs> you can get those in camera shops. This is a handy tip, also in the handout. You're not supposed to, but do you ever drop a film on the floor or drop a film down inside? And what are you going to do? You've got this whole set of film. You know, one film is not so terrible, but you'd like to get it. If you take an ordinary flashlight and go to a camera shop and ask them for a red filter, maybe they'll find one that fits right on the front. And if it doesn't, tape it on with electrical tape so no white light comes out. And you can use it for finding films that you dropped. Okay, this is what the talk is about. This is what we're here for. Monitoring film processing conditions. This is the trouble that we talked about, and this is what to do about it. And there it is. That's it, right there. Little tiny aluminum block. It's so small, I lost it on the way over here. I don't know where it is. I bought it, and it's in the handout. You can buy one. But like a lot of little gadgets, if you lose one, you forget about it, and that's the end of your whole quality control pro program. So I got a, another solution. That strange-looking thing are the rest of my little handouts. Now, I've only got a few of these, so I'm going to hand them out to look around. It's a homemade metal block. Would you pass those around? I got a few more. Just had my assistant make these up the other day. Got one more in here. Could we? Could you kind of hand them around a little bit? I'll give you a few. There's a bunch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's on the floor. <laughs> no, don't worry about. It. I mean, there's nothing. What it is, I'm sure you recognize. They're the lead foils from X-rays. Do-it-yourself test device. This is all you need. This is the road to success. This is 27 slides on how to do it. When I was in dental school, we used to wrap, we used copper dyes, and we had to wrap them with, with something or other to pour metal in the Stone Age. Anyway, this is not 27. You take a, a sheet of x-ray lead, and you put another one on top of it. 
and another one on top of it. And by the time you get the third one on, they're all sliding all over the place. It took me a little bit of time to figure out how to do it. So that's why all the slides. So you take the lead, little leads and you put them stepped about an eighth of an inch apart until you get eight of them, which is a practical number. And then this is the main secret to success, scotch tape, because they go sliding all over the place, okay? So you put one piece of scotch tape on and another piece of scotch tape on and then you do the back side and you put some more tape on and then you staple it right in the middle and cut it in half and now you have two because you're going to lose the first one and then you have a spare and any time, so there are some of them circulating around. Anytime you lose one, you take the second one and if you lose that you make some more. And there it is. It's just a little series of lead foils an eighth of an inch apart, eight of them is a practical number to work with. Well, what do you do with it? You put it under your x-ray machine on the countertop, and you take 20 films. Now, this is all in the handout. You don't have to listen. This is all in the handout. And Kodak tells you the same, same thing. But don't do it this way. This is wrong. The cone is here, and the desktop is here. And how would you standardize the distance. You could use a ruler and measure it. No, no, no. Put it right down on the countertop so it touches. So you take the, let me go back, you take the little, the little lead gizmo and you lay it not centered, don't cover the whole film, leave one part of it an eighth of an inch at the edge uncovered and then you will have a series of steps. You'll see what they look like. And you make 20 of them. And it looks like that. Now, when do you make it is extremely important. When you have fresh developer, when you know everything is working as well as it can possibly work, and this is what you're trying to compare to, that's when you make your first film. And this is what you're going to use for comparison. This is the one made with the little aluminum wedge, which Kodak illustrates, and it's much better. You see, you got more steps but it doesn't make that much difference. You need a rough approximation. You're not running a chem chemical analytical lab. You're just trying to get some idea what the heck's going on. This is Kodak's slide, and it tells you that you're going to use the middle of the scale as your main comparison. And this is what it looks like if you do one every day. And I looked and I looked and I looked, and I couldn't see any difference at all with any of these until day seven. Now day seven is light. And remember the slide that I didn't read to you that says if your x-rays are light, it means either your x-ray developer is weak, it's cold, or you develop for too short a time. We have to make the assumption that your exposures are constant. You could have something that looks like that if you didn't expose the test film properly. But we're assuming that, well, we, we did all the test films at once. So that, that, can on, that exposure can't enter in, take that back. It's only three things, cold developer, short development, or old developer. So they show you what, went, what goes wrong when something goes wrong, and typically it's too light. So seven day, day seven corrected means they re finally got around to replenishing the developer, which you should have been doing all along. That's what day seven corrected means. So if you're not replenishing on a daily basis, which you need to do, and if you're using a processor, I'm sure you are, some of the processors have automatic replenishing, which is really nice. But if you're doing it with manual or a non-automatic processor, you must replenish every day, whether you develop films or not. And again, if you read the little booklet from Kodak, has this all detailed in there. Because developer degenerates, whether you use it or not. So reviewing. Benefits of quality assurance. And number five, which isn't there, is it if the attorneys, if you need an attorney, he can't help you. We've got an attorney like that who will help you if you're in trouble. He can't help you if you don't have records. And, rec and x-rays are half your records. Okay, now we're, I told you how to figure out what's going wrong in your processing. If you got to the stage where you got those test trips and you still couldn't figure out what to do, then you might call somebody who knows more about x-ray than you do. Most of the time, that's all you need to know. So there, Kodak threw this in for free, and we can talk a little bit about it. There is 
the two kinds of x-ray film that are on the market now, Kodak's brands, there are others that are good, ACFA sells film in the USA too. And they have a sheet that they will send you for free that tells you what film to use for what and when. But here's something new, x-rays without film. I really shouldn't show this because this would invalidate the whole rest of my talk. If you didn't have any film, you wouldn't have to process it. And if you don't have to process it, you don't have to worry about processing quality control. And that's where we're going. This is from France. And this <coughs> is what is used instead of film. This is a nice consultation room, isn't it? I don't know how we'd make a living. They still got the x-ray machine. You still got the lead apron on. And I think they did that to show that with this system, you put a sensor in the mouth, which is actually the sensing device out of a camcorder called a charge coupled device in a little plastic package with a wire on the end. The wire goes into a PC with an image capture board, and the image is instantly digitized, displayed on the monitor before you can get back in the room. What a dream that is for the endodontics you don't do. <laughs> or for anything where you want to know quickly. Let's say you removed a tooth and you think you got an apex left in there and the patient is in surgery, bleeding, and you want to know whether you have an apex to go after. Instant x-ray, talk about Polaroid, instant x-ray. It's on the market and it's go you're going to see a lot more of it. The term for this is radiovisiography, coined by the company that makes this unit, which is a French company, marketing it in this country under the name Trophy. And this is an early version. They've already modified it. You have to buy their x-ray machine and their computer and so forth. Gendex, one of the biggest American companies, has already got a gadget that will allow you to retrofit it to a conventional machine, but they can't seem to get it through FDA for some reason that makes no sense to me. And there are three or four other companies. Uh, the FDA is very busy with more pressing matters, I guess. Anyway, this is what it looks like. You can do all kinds of things. Once you get an x-ray digitized, you can enhance contrast. You can enhance outlines. You can assign artificial colors to contrast. You can do anything. And you can send it over the phone lines with a modem when insurance companies are ready. And they will be the last ones, I assure you then you will be able to transmit your records, not only your computerized patient records, but your computerized x-rays. And if you understand the new health care plan, one of the parts is high priority on electronic insurance claims. And if you were sent them, sent them in this way, they wouldn't get lost. It's coming. It's coming. It's going to take some time. These units are about $20,000 right now. They will come down just like my Denticam, my Fuji Denticam, is now down half price. So now we get back to the real world, and it's just a little bit here on how to look at x-rays. How are you going to tell if you have a problem if you can't see what's going on? Well, we all do this. We take an x-ray and we hold it up to the light. You really, maybe you think you're seeing something, but it's awfully hard to see. If, on the other hand, you put it in a little cardboard mount, and you hold it up the same way, assuming you don't have light falling on the front of it, you see much more. Masking. This is b without a mount, same x-ray with a mount. Okay? So how you look at x-rays is awfully important. Well, that <coughs> involves what kind of a mount you put them in. And there are all kinds of mounts. Here are four different popular kinds. They're all no good. They're all terrible. This one is frosted. You see a lot of those. You don't need frosting because Kodak, who was the pioneer, made films matte, have a matte finish about 35, 40 years ago. So there's no need to add diffusion. It destroys contrast, makes it hard to see. So you don't want that. So they came out with this, which is glass clear, which is really good. And it's a pocket mount, which is great because the x-rays don't fall out. And that's a real problem. These are nice. They're, they are clear as can be because there's nothing there, but the x-rays fall out. So that's no good. So what do you want? You want a really clear, thin pocket mount. And this is one which uh, you probably know about. It's called Ada mounts. 
made by Block Drug in the handout. There's another one that I learned about in Sweden, which is called Troll Mounts. Those are the two, the only two that I know of so far in the market. They are thin, they're clear, they have the area between the films masked off so that you can see well. And then when you look at them this way with a masked off view box, then you can really see something. Now this slide had to be made with visible light so you could see what he's doing, but it's wrong to do it this way, which is to say in a lit, in a lighted room, you've got light falling on the front of your x-rays and it looks, if in an exaggerated way, it looks like that. You don't really see much. What you want to do is look at them in a darkened room. And there's some funny looking guy, but he's got a magnifying glass. This is the way you read x-rays. This is the way every x-ray department in every dental school in the world looks at x-rays. They don't look at them out on the floor, holding it up to the light. You have a semi-darkened room and you use magnification. And you do it in a quiet environment. Now, I don't know how else to do it. I go in my office and do it at night and on weekends. Once in a while, we get a cancellation and I can run in my office and do some in there, but I turn the lights off and I have a miserably dark little consulting room. My wife hates it, but it's great for this. Okay, I've tried to keep it short. We're back to Pacific Grove because if you have a little time left over, if you don't all have to catch a plane, take a drive around the end of this Monterey Peninsula. It's gorgeous and it'll give you a little breather. Questions? Good, because it's all in the handout. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. Okay. Good job. This concludes the uh, meeting, but I... How did we do time-wise? What time did I start? Started about... It's a little over half hour. Better and better. And if you were in February, I don't see how that was possible. But I think this one uh, did it. Um, next year, we'd like to see more positions. And some of your colleagues, so kind of work on that, and uh, Thank you. Uh, so we can uh, change uh, dentistry's uh, misdirection. Okay, uh, have a safe trip home, and if anybody has anything they want to say, they come up and say it now. While uh, I guess the cameras are off. Let's give Ed and Carol a real rousing applause for putting this whole thing together. I, I, want, I want to give Carol all the credit that she deserves because without her, then we wouldn't have a meeting. <laughs> so you can, yeah, that's the truth of it. <laughs> My name is John Lachlan. I'm president of the Holistic Dental Association. And I want to congratulate you too on a fantastic program. I've been trying to get here for five years and I'm glad I finally made it. Um, there are some brochures from the Holistic Dental Association that are out in the other room underneath the uh, biological dentistry. Um, what your charts, the new charts that um, are so well done. And if anybody Take a look at our new charts, they're really great. They're going to be ready next week. <laughs> if anybody wants to pick up any of the brochures that we have, um, we'd be glad to have you do that. The Holistic Dental Association. Um, and embodies everything that all of you do. So we're from non-toxic uh, dentistry and uh, we believe real strongly in the whole idea that the, the teeth are connected to the rest of the body. And there's a couple of board members that we have here right now. Steve O'Dell, want to stand up, Steve? And Bob Stefan. Bob, want to stand up? So. Uh, we're working hard to, to promote uh, everything. And I'd really like to see someday a, an organization that encompasses all of us so that we can take the splinter groups that, uh, that are present and unite them so that we have a little bit stronger uh, voice in holistic and um, alternative dentistry. I, I think that will, that will come. Yeah. Now here they are. These are the tin shell bells that we usually Ring in, uh, so you get out of the exhibit room and come into the meeting room. So 
Well, you could, I just found them in the box over here and I need the chart, so better late than never. <laughs> A little parting energy. Yeah. <laughs>